اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والحمد للہ الذی جعلنا من المتمسکین بولاية امیر المؤمنین ولائمت المعصومین علیہم السلام والحمد للہ الذی هدانا لہذا وما کنا لنہتدی لولا ان هدانا اللہ والحمد للہ الذی لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحسي نعماءه العادون ولا يودي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا أجل ممدود فطر الخلائق بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته ووتد بالصخور ميدان أرضه ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المظلمين حبيب إله العالمين بالقاسم المصطفى محمد صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على عدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أستق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يسبح لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض الملك القدوس العزيز الحكيم آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلي على محمد وآل محمد أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. There is no doubt that it's due to His kindness and generosity that He provides for us opportunities such as these where we gather in remembrance and in reflection of Him Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Next we begin this sermon the way the commander of the faithful Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi ma'afdalu salatu wa salam. Would begin many of his sermons by saying, "Usikum wa nafsi bi taqwallahil azim." I advise you and I advise myself to be God-conscious, God-fearing, and pious human beings. We have ended the chapter of the Asma Allah al Husna, and we begin a new chapter today, insha Allah. And we felt that. The way we will start this new chapter is through the explanation or the tafsir of Surah Al-Jumu'ah. Um, we recite this surah every, surah every Friday and it's important, most of us have indeed memorized it. So it's important we understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intends for us to take from this surah with the constant repetition of a minimum once a week insha'Allah. Surah Al-Jumu'ah is the 62nd surah of the Holy Qur'an and in it contains 11 verses. It is said to be a Madani surah. And what that means is that the surah was revealed while the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam Amma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad was in Medina. Now this understanding, we know that the surahs, the 114 surahs of the entire Qur'an can be broken up into the location of either being Makki or being Madani, Ahsantum. The way that we come about this understanding, ulama have taken different approaches. When you study, for example, the science of the Qur'an or ulumul Qur'an, which is one of the fundamental studies that we teach in madaris, as well it is taught in the hawzas, and something that we as general lay human beings like yourself and myself, um, we try to understand the holistic understand a holistic picture of the Holy Quran. So here we get the subject of how to know whether a surah is Makki or Madani. Some ulama say that the way you know is by criteria of location. That means where the Prophet was when the surah was revealed will tell you whether the surah is Makki or Madani. Of course, that criteria in itself is filled with flaws because what if the Prophet was neither in Makkah or Medina? 
Yeah? What if the Prophet had gone, for example, in a ghazwa, in a battle? What if the Prophet was in between the two cities? How then would we identify a surah to be Makki or Madani? Based on these flaws, the ulama then said, then we cannot use the criteria of location. Others have said we can use the criteria of addressee. If you look at the Holy Quran, there are numerous verses in which Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala will begin by saying, Ya Ibn Adam, Ya Bani Adam, Ya, ya Ayyuhan Nas. Whenever there is this type of general address, they say those surahs are Makki. And when Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala addresses believers, Ya Ayyuhal Ladina, Amanu, those are Madani. Now that in itself is not a 100% flawless criteria. The biggest um, hitch to that particular criteria is that there are more verses than not that don't have a specific address. So how then would we be able to identify whether they are Makki or Madani? And so they came with a third criteria, and that is the criteria of period. The criteria of period states that there is one period in the 23 years of Risala that distinguishes and, deli, del, um, and then assigns whether a surah is Makki or whether a surah is Madani. And that particular period would be Ahsantum Hijra. Yeah? That at Hijra, anything prior to that would be considered Makki and anything after Hijra would be considered Madani, Ahsantum. And of course the criteria is even more specific that it is when the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family entered Medina. So any revelation that happened during the journey between Makkah and Medina would still be called Makki. Now of course there are some surahs in the Holy Quran which we have both verses which came before Hijra and after Hijra, and thus they further distinguish this criteria by saying that wherever the majority of the verses were revealed. Yeah? So it could be that certain surahs of the Holy Quran, which let's say have a hundred verses, 15 of those were revealed prior to Hijra, but 85 of those came after Hijra. Those would be considered to be Madani. Suratul Jumu'ah in its essence is considered to be Madani, especially when we consider that it talks about the establishment of Salatul Jumu'ah. The establishment of Salatul Jumu'ah lets us know that the Muslimin had their own masjid and that they were firmly established where they could hold this type of event where everybody would then be advised to attend. As far as the merits of reciting Suratul Jumu'ah, the, the fadilat of Suratul Jumu'ah, we find a hadith from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam. Muhammad Wa Ali. Where he says, وَمَنْ كَرَعَ سُورَةُ الْجُمُعَةِ أُعْتِيَ عَشَرَ حَسَنَاتِ بِعَدَدِ مَنْ أَتَى الْجُمُعَةِ وَبِعَدَدِ مَنْ لَمْ يَأْتِهَا فِي أَمْصَارِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Subhanallah. He says that one who recites Surah al they will get ten times the reward of all those who attended Salat al and those who did not attend Salat al from the Muslimin. Yeah? So we see the great benefit of this, surah, uh, of this surah and this is why we are advised to recite it not only on Fridays yeah? but also Thursday nights we find numerous hadiths that tell us the importance of reciting this and so much so has been added to the importance of Surah al that a man would ask for example our sixth Imam Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali and he says that I cannot attend Surah al for whatever reason. Should I then recite Surah Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad in my Zuhr Salah? The Imam says, no, recite Surah al in your Zuhr Salah. Yeah? This is the benefit and the importance of Surah al It's 11 verses. We ask our 13-year-olds in madrasas to memorize this. Therefore, we have no excuse of not memorizing it. And we should try our best to live this Surah. And of course, these merits that they are talked about, are not just for one who recites them as parrots, it's for one who recites them with understanding and takes the benefit from them. As far as the general gist of the surah is concerned, now we're going to go slowly, we, don't, we have time on our side, alhamdulillah. Yeah? So we're going to take this slowly and get the full maximum benefit from it, inshaAllah. As far as the general gist of this surah, 11 verses, but our ulama say that these 11 verses can be broken up into 5 topics. Yeah. The first topic that can be discussed is the 
is how every creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who glorifies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we look at this, we will inshallah discuss this next week. It's very fabulous how the Quran discusses the glorification of the creation and what we understand from that. But of course, this glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happens because of the might of Allah, because of the sovereignty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how every creation recognizes the this sovereignty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thus do his tasbih. The second point or the second summary of the surah, the subject that is discussed is the purpose of sending the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses two main reasons why he sent the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. The first one is ta'alimi and the second one is tarbawi. Yeah? That the Prophet was sent with two main goals and two main messages. The first is to teach. Yu'allimuhumul yeah? kitab. Yeah, to teach you the book, to teach you the guidance which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to follow. But the second point is tarbawi, to make us into better human beings, to make us into human beings who have great akhlaq. Because really, as we discussed, ilm without action is worthless. Yeah? Likewise, action without that ilm and iman has not the same value. Therefore, the Prophet was sent with these two main messages and are discussed in detail in this surah. The third point in this surah is a warning against believers not to go astray the way the Yahud went astray. Yeah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very clearly mentions this in the fifth verse of this surah, isn't it? Yeah? That don't be like them. That when they were given this guidance, they rejected it and turned their back away from it. Yeah? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us of this in, the, in this particular surah. The fourth point that is discussed in this surah is the inescapable reality of death. Yeah? That there is not a human being that will escape the reality of death and that we will all meet our maker in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have our deeds accounted for. The fifth point of this surah is the importance of, surah to, of, of Salatul Jumu'ah. Yeah? The last three verses of this surah describe the importance of Salatul Jumu'ah and how we should do our utmost best to make sure that we attend Salatul Jumu'ah. You know when we look at the ahkam, we know that Salatul Jumu'ah is not a wajib salah, it is wajib ikhtiyari. Yeah? Most of the maraja say it is wajib ikhtiyari. What that means is that you have a choice between Salatul Zuhr and Salatul Jumu'ah. Whichever one you take checks off your box of wujub. Yeah? But for any reason you decide not to recite or come for Salatul Jumu'ah, anything that you do during the time of Salatul Jumu'ah becomes kiraha. Yeah? becomes makruh. So if you go buy something during that time, if you do business at that time, it is an action which is detested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus He advises us and recommends us to attend. This wajib ikhtiyari of course is only during the time of ghaybah. When the Imam of our time, Ajjal Allah ta'ala farajahu sharif, Salla Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, will come inshallah. When He will come, it will become a wajib. Act that everyone has to attend Salatul Jumu'ah. Inshallah, next week, if God gives us life, we will begin the first verse of Salah of Suratul Jumu'ah and discuss the beauty of it. Wa akhiru da'wan an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. A'udhu billahi min al shaytan al rajim. Bismillahi rahman al rahim. Qul hu wallahu ahad. Allahu samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakullahu kufu wa nahad. Sadaqallahu al ali al rajim. ما صلى على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكال الظالمين سريخ المستصرخين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين 
اللهم صل على خاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى وصل على سيد الوصيين امير المؤمنين علي بن ابي طالب صل على محمد وعلى محمد وصل على الصديقه الطاهره فاطمه الزهراء سيده نساء العالمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وصل على سبتي الرحمه وامامي الهدى الحسن والحسين سيدي شباب اهل الجنه اللهم صل على محمد وصل على علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والحجة القائم المهدي صلاة لا غاية لعددها ولا نهاية لمددها ولا نفاد لأمدها اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات وتابع بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد In the second sermon I want to talk about a tragic and saddening trend that we see across the pond in Europe which was brought further into our eyesight by the by the picture of that young 3-year-old um 3-year-old Syrian boy who had drowned um and his body was found in the beach um in Turkey this um this plight of refugees or those who are stateless or homeless because of war torn countries or because of looking for a better financial situation has been going on for many years now but it has come in the limelight over the past few months in particular yes it's true that we here in the far west are not necessarily um feeling this or seeing this day to day but we see it in the news and as believers we are told to be concerned about every human being especially um the muslims we find that these refugees um are trying to escape their war torn countries and the numbers vary according to certain reports from this year alone um there have been anywhere from 250 to 300,000 refugees who have tried to flee um either their own countries or countries in which they had become refugees to try to enter the European Union yeah and of course this happens through crossing the Mediterranean Sea um and when we look at the pictures of how they are trying to get across obviously there are not safe conditions uh, whatsoever and because of these anywhere between 2000 and 3000 have died um trying to make this journey into um safer times and safer areas now the consequence of this is that many of these european nations have tried to prevent some of these refugees from entering and when we look at these reports we find for example countries like hungary hungary um serves as an entry point into the european union um from those crossing from greece and the balkans um they are in the process of erecting a 109 mile barbed wire fence um to prevent the people from entering from the mediterranean sea um furthermore bulgaria is announcing a 100 mile fence with this border with turkey uh, france and britain have done similar projects in the french city of calais to build this fenced area where either they remain there or they don't enter into their countries The sad part about all of this is that it is the same money that has brought war into those countries yeah that has promoted war into those countries you look at some of the refugees coming from Libya the European Union funded the attack on Libya yeah you look at countries people coming from Syria the European Union funded the attack on Syria and continue to fund it and now when those who country they attacked are coming for help they close the doors to them yeah and this is what's saddening this is what this is the plight unfortunately we see and the blame goes to muslims as well 
Yeah? You look at reports that have come about recently, countries like Kuwait, countries like Saudi Arabia, countries like the UAE and Qatar have not allowed a single refugee to enter into their countries. Yeah? These are the Muslims yeah, who have turned their back against fellow Muslims, while countries like Turkey have taken close to 1.8 million refugees. Countries like Lebanon, which is in itself not in a great condition, has taken 1.2 million refugees. But you look at the richest of the rich and how they treat, and this really tells us and paints a picture about what they think about Muslims as a whole. My brothers and sisters, the point of, of mentioning this is I think that this is a very big test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? And eventually I have no doubt that this test will come and test us as well in our borders and how we respond. Are we going to be the type of brothers yeah? and the type of sisters who pray for them? Are we going to be the type of brothers who donate towards these cause? Or are we going to be the type of brothers who open our doors to them? Yeah? Who allow them to come into our homes and live with us? And this is the test of ukhuwa of brotherhood placed upon us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see very clearly that when hijrah happened, when migration happened, there was a test of ukhuwa that was taken by Allah wa ta'ala. Yeah? And the Ansar not only prayed for them, not only gave them money, but they allowed them to enter into their homes. Yeah? This is true ukhuwa. This is true brotherhood. And Allah wa ta'ala wants us to see the level of our ukhuwa, my brothers and sisters. Consider this a test. Consider this a responsibility of each and every one of us to at least be in one of these three categories right now where we are either remembering them and praying for them daily or we are sending money towards them so that they can have an easier time or when the time comes we will organize and be that type of community that sets up shop and homes for us and these refugees who come. Inshallah, we will be amongst all three of these categories when the test presents itself to us. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them that they find safety and shelter, inshallah. I can't, I can't end without telling us and reminding us yeah, the importance, the importance of praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the safety that He has provided us. Yeah? We're not there with our three-year-old child crossing um, rough waters trying to get to a free land or a better land. Yeah? We have found it, alhamdulillah. We should thank Allah wa ta'ala every day for this blessing and make sure that we are not jahil or ignorant about it, inshaAllah. Wa akhiru da'wan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صدق الله العلي العظيم